Hey guys, Brock Shield here, back with you with the next video in our series, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Without further ado, returning to The Great Gatsby. Look here, old sport, said Gatsby, leading toward me. I'm afraid I made you a little angry this morning in the car. There was the smile again. But this time I held out against it. I don't like mis I, I, I don't like mysteries, I answered, and I don't understand why you won't come out frankly and tell me what you want. Why has it all got to come through Miss Baker? Oh, it's nothing underhand, he assured me. Miss Baker's a great sportswoman, you know, and she'd never do anything that wasn't all right. Suddenly, he looked at his watch, jumped up and hurried from the room, leaving me with Mr. Wolfsheim at the table. He has to telephone, said Mr. Wolfsheim, following him with his eyes. Fine fellow, isn't he? Handsome to look at, and a perfect gentleman. Yes, he's an Oxford man. Oh, he went to Oxford College in England. You know, Oxford College? I've heard of it. It's one of the most famous colleges in the world. Have you known Gatsby for a long time? I inquired. Several years, he answered in a gratified way. I made the pleasure of his acquaintance just after the war. But I knew I had discovered a man of fine breeding after I talked with him an hour. I said to myself, There's the kind of man you'd like to take home and introduce to your mother and sister. He paused. I see you're looking at my cuff buttons. I hadn't been looking at them, but I I hadn't been looking at them, but I did now. They were composed of oddly familiar pieces of ivory. Finest specimens of human molars, he informed me. Well, I inspected them. That's a very interesting idea. Yeah. He flipped his sleeves up under his coat. Yeah. Gatsby's very careful about women. He would never so much as look at a friend's wife. When the subject of this instinctive trust returned to the table and sat down, Mr. Wolfsheim drank his coffee with a jerk and got to his feet. I have enjoyed my lunch, he said, and I'm going to run off from you two young men before I outstay my welcome. Don't hurry, Meyer, said Gatsby, without enthusiasm. Mr. Wolfsheim raised his hand in a sort of benediction. You're very polite, but I announced to but I belong to another generation, he announced solemnly. You sit here and discuss your sports and your young ladies and your he supplied an imaginary noun with another wave of his hand. As for me, I'm fifty years old, and I won't impose myself on you any longer as he shook hands and turned away his tragic nose, was trembling. I wondered if, he, if I had said anything to offend him. He, be, he becomes very sentimental sometimes, explained Gatsby. This is one of his sentimental days. He's quite a character around New York, a denizen of Broadway. Who is he, anyhow? An actor? No, a dentist? Mayor Wolfsheim? No, he's a gambler. Gatsby hesitated, then added coolly. He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. Fixed the World Series, I repeated. The idea staggered me. I remembered, of course, that the World Series had been fixed in 1919. But if I had thought of it all at all, I would have thought of it as a thing that merely happened, the end of some inevitable chain. It never occurred to me that one man could start to play with the faith of fifty million people, with the single-mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. How did he happen to do that? I asked after a minute. He just saw the opportunity. Why isn't he in jail? They can't get him, old sport. He's a smart man. I insisted on paying the check. As the waiter brought my change, I caught sight of Tom Buchanan across the crowded room. Come along with me for a minute, I said, 
I've got to say hello to someone. When he saw us, Tom jumped up and took half a dozen steps in our direction. Where have you been? he demanded eagerly. Days is furious because you haven't called up. This is Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Buchanan. They shook hands. Briefly, and a strained, unfamiliar look of embarrassment came over Gatsby's face. How have you been, anyhow? demanded Tom of me. How do you happen to come up this far to eat? I've been having lunch with Mr. Gatsby. I turned toward Mr. Gatsby, but he was no longer there. One October day in 1917, said Jordan Baker that afternoon, sitting up very straight on a straight chair in the tea garden at the Plaza Hotel. I was walking along from one place to another half on the sidewalks and half on the lawns. I was happier on the lawns because I had on shoes from England with rubber nods on the soles that bit into the soft ground. I had on a new plaid skirt also that blew a little in the wind, and whenever this happened, the red, white, and blue banners in front of all the houses stretched out stiff and said, tut, 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 in a disapproving way. The largest of the banners and the largest of the lawns belonged to Daisy Fay's house. She was just 18, two years older than me, and by far the most popular of all the young girls in Louisville. She dressed in white and had a little white roadster and all day long the telephone rang in her house and excited young officers from Camp Taylor demanded the privilege of monopolizing her that night. Anyways, for an hour. When I came opposite her house that morning her white roadster was beside the curb and she was sitting in it with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They were so engrossed in each other that she didn't see me until I was five feet away. Hello, Jordan, she called unexpectedly. Please come here. I was flattered that she wanted to speak to me because of all the older girls I admired most. I admired her most. She asked me if I was going to the Red Cross to make and make bandages. I was. Well then, would I tell him that she couldn't come that day? The officer looked at Daisy while she was speaking, in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at sometime, and because it seemed romantic to me, I have remembered the incident ever since. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I didn't lay eyes on him again for over four years. Even after I'd met him on Long Island, I didn't realize it was the same man. That was 1917. By the next year, I had a few bow myself, and I began to play in tournaments, so I didn't see Daisy very often. She went with a slightly older crowd, when she went with anyone at all. Wild rumors were circulating about her, how her mother had found her packing her bag one winter night to go to New York and say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas. She was effectually prevented. But she wasn't on speaking terms with her family for several weeks. After that, she didn't play around with the soldiers any more, but only a few flat-footed, short-sighted young men in town who couldn't get into the op at all. By the next autumn, she was gay again, gay as ever. She had a debut after the armistice, and in February, she was presumably engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June, she married Tom Buchanan of Chicago, with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville ever knew before. He came down with a hundred people in four private cars and hired a whole floor of the Seal Back Hotel. And the day before the wedding, he gave her a string of pearls, he gave her a string of pearls valued at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.